So four day week, I think, takes on many different paths. For some people, they think of four day week as a compressed traditional work week. So 40 hours into four days. Uh, that's not what we're actually advocating for. We advocate for a reduced working hour schedule. So we use what's called a 180-100 principle, which we founded, which is 100% pay, 80% time and 100% output. Welcome to the 7 Day Soul TV and the A Tweak A Week podcast. If you are someone who wants to reach your full potential, who feels like you have more to give, who doesn't want to let your short time here slip through your fingers, then you finally found your tribe. I'm your host, psychologist and author Susanna Healy, and on this show, we'll be talking with expert researchers about all things psyche and soul so that you can achieve your full potential and live a life without regrets. To reach the better angels of our nature, we know the devil's in the detail of what we do repeatedly. So we'll be talking habits, existential health, bucket lists, meaning, mattering, sleep, self-actualization, responsibility, discipline, faith, procrastination, gratitude, goal setting, sex, focus, careers, and loads more. Let's inject the everyday with a passion for your potential. But before we start, just a reminder, if you like the show, then don't forget to subscribe. You can also get your free 100 tips for daily progress by visiting the 7 daysoulcom homepage. Or if your workplace is all about human potential and you'd like to sponsor the show, then reach out to join us. Details are in the show notes. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to episode nine of the A Tweak A Week podcast. I'm Susanna Healy. Delighted that you're joining us here today. Uh, Today, I have with me Dr. Dale Wheelahan, who's a behavioral scientist. He's CEO of the Four Day Week Global. Um, and has an absolutely fascinating background. He's a kind of a wellness expert uh, and behavioral scientist. So there's an awful lot here, I think, that we could, Dale and I can you know, unpack in this conversation. In terms of where we're going, is there's so many conversations in the ether at the moment about you know, work from home versus work from the office and you know, the fighting absenteeism, and we'll be talking about presenteeism as well. And you know, there's quite a push at the moment for, for companies to get the workforce to come back to the office. So this, I think, is going to be a really, really interesting conversation and maybe something that offers us a new idea in terms of you know, problem solutions, in terms of you know, how do we re-engage with the workplace. So loads and loads to unpack here. Uh, Dale, you're really, really welcome, and thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Susanna. It's a, it's a privilege, privilege. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Good stuff. Dale, I think, first of all, would you mind, um, I think a lot of people will have heard about the four-day work week as a, you know, just kind of this, a movement, as it were. They may be a little bit surprised to find that there's actual organization and a kind of a research organization behind it. So could you tell us a little bit more about the organization? Yeah, for sure. So, Four day week, I think, takes on many different paths. For some people, they think of four day week as a compressed traditional work week. So 40 hours into four days. Uh, That's not what we're actually advocating for. We advocate for a reduced working hour schedule. So we use what's called a 180-100 principle, which we founded, which is 100% pay, 80% time and 100% output. And so the Mm -hmm. organization was founded by Andrew Barnes and Charlotte Lockhart, who are leaders of a business in Auckland called Perpetual Guardian, and they trialed this methodology on their own company. I think what's often it, it, the the initial things you get around why a four-day week won't work are often those concerns from the business, the business mm-hmm. leaders themselves saying, we can't do this because this, this, and this. So we, from the very outset of this organization, we've taken business leaders' you know concerns into trial design. So we're not looking at compromising on business performance or productivity. In fact, the opposite, we're looking to maintain it, if not improve it to reduce working hours. So what we have been doing as an organization is running global pilot studies across the world. We've published findings in Ireland, the UK, the US, South Africa, uh, Australasia. And what's consistently becoming the, the narrative now is that when you reduce working time within organizations, that leads to a catalyst of change uh, within organizations to figure out where the inefficiencies are in their working day and actually mitigate or, or remove them so that people are working smarter, but not longer. Hmm. Because it does, if we're going to an 80% working hours, it does presume that there is 20% wastage kind of across the board in all companies, doesn't it? Um, and yet, I suppose some companies will argue that kind of like, well, some some companies are a lot more wasteful or less efficient and streamlined than others. But 
do you find, does your research find that generally speaking, that 80 20 rule applies in terms of efficiency versus inefficiency? Yeah, for sure. And if in, in some instances, actually, it's it's more than that. So actually, mm. we, some organizations reduce working time by even more than 20%. For larger organizations, they may wish to take a more gradual re- approach to reduction in working hours. So there's no one size fits all on the type of four day week that's going to work for your business and how you're going to implement it. When people think of four day week, they think Monday to Thursday and the office close on Friday. That's mm-hmm. what naturally arises in our minds. But mm. I've seen so many uh, innovative approaches to that 180, 100 rules. So we've seen some businesses allowing that Monday to Thursday for some staff and Tuesday to Friday for others. So you're actually Mm -hmm. making that service provision. Others have brought in a five day shorter work week. So actually it's equivalent to a four day week in traditional working hour time. And others have looked at their time and loose structure um, and actually brought that in when we see situations where people maybe have to work full time during peaks uh, of the of the business year uh, and then compensating for that through you know sufficient uh, time off in lieu so there's been many ways depending on what the business's needs are um, yeah ultimately what we're trying to do is reduce working time do you find it's a hard sell or do some companies kind of do you find that there's more is it more youthful companies or smaller companies perhaps that have the ability to be agile quicker and to change their processes are they better candidates for this or do you find some kind of very much dragging their heels and others are really open to new ideas yeah so you know when i was involved in this movement in ireland you know two and three years ago um i remember meeting with some of the chambers of commerce and them saying this will never happen full mm-hmm. stop we're in a very different space now in mm-hmm. 2024 where actually gartner said four day weeks are going to go from you know out there to conventional within businesses this year. So we have seen a rapid escalation in in this as a potential future of work intervention. I think it has been by and large led through the publication of our trials data over the last few years and providing that evidence base. And they have been by and large small and medium enterprises driving that change. Because as you say, Susanna, they tend to be able to be innovative and creative and more agile uh, quicker. They're also using it as a unique value proposition for themselves because they might not be able to compete on things like salary uh, within the bigger companies. But that has created this groundswell now where you have the public sector and you have some of the larger private organizations globally doing versions of their own four day week trial now as well in order to try and, um, again, attract the top talent. So talent acquisition has become the major driver, I would say. Um, of this conversation for businesses hmm. and i mean obviously there's there's some there's some nature some business nature for example you know hospitals and there's some that have to be face to face in retail and that kind of thing to some to some extent um are there other companies that this doesn't suit is there any is there any data or any suggestion that certain companies it doesn't suit or is this something that can be applicable everywhere well, again, I think that this is a sectoral wide endeavor. This is not something that should be creating a further divide between the white and blue collar sectors or the public mm. sector. Um, you take healthcare. My own background is in healthcare. I did my PhD on fatigue and burnout and surgeons, one of the professions with the longest working hours, you know, in the country. Mm. And it is evident to me that if we don't do something radical in healthcare at this point, we are going to completely cripple the system. So. We know that all of our healthcare staff are burned out at the moment. Mm -hmm. We know that the mental health interventions are not working. Um, And what we're doing is we are burning people out who are then leaving and then putting more stress on the current staffing structure. And when you do that, you end up having to compensate by bringing in more agency staff, bringing in, investing more in recruitment and retention uh, interventions. Instead, let's look at things a little bit more macro and say, okay, we're going to bring in a four day week for all our healthcare staff. That means we will have to hire 20% more staff in order to compensate for that time reduction. But actually longer term, we probably have a cost saving here because a current salaried staff only costs a quarter of what we're currently spending on agency staff. We're not having to uh, deal with as much sick leave, as much absenteeism, as much recruitment drive um, costs. So, That's what consistently all the research is showing around those public sector trials, Mm -hmm. Iceland being the largest public sector trial of this 
uh, showcasing that. So I would say that a four day week looks different in different sectors, yeah. but it can work in every sector if there's will. By the yeah. And as you said earlier, I think it, it's absolutely true. Everybody presumes it's kind of, oh, Friday off kind of thing. That That's what everybody presumes. So it's actually just, we really need to kind of expand it and just expand our knowledge about it. So we're more mature in our decisions about this and, and looking more flexible and, and see how much flexibility there actually is in this, um, I, I think, isn't it? Um, do you think this is an answer? I mentioned there about this push on at the moment. A lot There's a lot of kind of companies now that are actually saying, no, you, you need to be coming back to the office. And there's a real push on to get people back to the office. Um, and then there's this argy-bargy, for want of a better word, there's just this, you know, this um, combat that's kind of cr cr being created in terms of, no, we're not budging kind of thing. Do you think this might be an answer to that problem? Yeah, I mean, I think leaders who are still stuck in those old paradigms of working are really struggling with a completely different workforce that has emerged from the pandemic. So, mm. you know, people people changed their lives during the pandemic. People mm. moved far away. People bought houses. People felt for the first time <laughs> maybe breathing space in their yeah. lives and are not willing to compromise and give up on that anymore. Um it's it's being tied in with the whole conversation around inflation and cost of living and salaries not matching, you know, with rising rents and, you know, extorted costs. So people are, are I think, are, are holding on and grasping on to the one thing that they have at the moment, which is time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my old fiance, she commutes to Dublin every day. It took her an hour and a half to, to get up to the city today. It'll take her an hour and a half to get back this evening. That is not mm -hmm. you know, a sustainable way in the 21st century for our yeah. people, but also more importantly, for our environment as well. So mm. I think what's driving the conversation around commuting at the, or around return to office mandates at the moment, in many instances, is real estate. Um, mm. so people wanting their, their workers back in the office. It's under the guise of we want to recreate company culture, but culture is not created by just having people in the space. Mm. Uh, leaders create culture. Mm. And we've created a culture in our team across five continents and it's about being deliberate in trying to make that happen so i think in the conversation on a four-day week having people in the office or having people at home is not the question as much it's what are you having your people do in those spaces so mm -hmm. if you know by and large majority of people working from home is probably a good time for them to do deep flow work that they might um not have the time to do if they were in the office but if we're having people in the office Use that time um, for people that are there. Let's do collaboration. Let's do teamwork-based stuff. Let's not have people in, in hot desks on Zoom calls all day to the person that's across the room from them. It's completely counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of your own organization, how do you create th that culture? Apart from that kind of, you know, when we're together, we do collaborative stuff. Are there other ways to create culture? Because I think that, uh, just as you say, that is a major fear of companies that where people are beginning to disengage or kind of they feel like they're, they're letting go of the reins a little bit too much kind of thing and they're frightened of people just disengaging from work. How do you keep that culture together and that connectivity together? Hmm. I think I'm fortunate that I'm a behavioral scientist. So I have all these psychological theories running through my mind um, hmm. And I'm trying to do stuff with my team. And I think there is a hell of a lot that leaders in, in the world of work could actually get from learning some of those theories and trying to understand them in the context of the workplace. Mm. For me, I, I always draw down to self-determination theory. So ultimately, what we are trying to do is build intrinsic motivation of the workforce. If we mm. do that, you know, it's golden, you know. So mm. self-determination would say there are three things that we need to create. We need to create autonomy for our people we need a sense for people we need to create work that allows people to create a sense of competency or mastery over their work and we need to create a sense of connectedness uh, with people so as a leader i need to not micromanage i need to trust my workforce that enables autonomy um i need to be very clear on what good looks like in work which is what many workforces don't do mm -hmm. clear kpis clear vision of what a project uh, success looks like that allows the worker to understand what competency or mastery in their work looks like and mm -hmm. last connection so you know loneliness is rising worldwide we know that. and 
we're not harnessing the potential of teamwork actually to be an asset to combat that loneliness, but also to exponentially improve our performance. And that's because we think we're good at working in teams, but we're not. Um, and we're not doing enough interventions to actually figure out how to work better in teams. Mm-hmm. So in my, the biggest thing I did around that for connectivity, because we have multiple cultures in our team from Brazil, America, South Africa, mm-hmm. New Zealand, uh, Bulgaria. And I focused on psychological safety as that key intervention to build connectivity. So I showed a lot of vulnerability as a leader. I said, I don't have all the answers. Um, mm-hmm company's not going to grow because of me uh, and often will do so despite of me because uh, I might have one idea but you'll have a better idea um, so we focus a lot on actually you know creating collective interventions that weren't just being driven by me um, from the top down I have this saying that I use a lot um those who don't see the eye in team will soon see the eye in exit. <laughs> because I do think a lot of the time people slap on this idea of we're a team kind of thing, but actually you can either be, there's a difference between a group of people and a team. There, there's definitely, there's a, a sense of cohesion and belonging and also a, a seeing of the individual and individual needs, I think. Would you, would you agree with that? I mean, I, I kind of feel people do need to learn how to design teams properly. Well, I mean, the reason is we're not we're not rewarding teamwork. So actually, our performance management systems are still very rooted in individual performance. And you think back to all, you know, graduates coming out of master degrees now in management or whatever it is, all of those team based activities that they would have done as part of their masters, they all are ultimately being assessed at the individual level to a certain mm-hmm. degree, um, and they all come out hating teamwork. So actually. Even at that very, you know, um, that that pedagogical approach and how we approach teamwork and learning how to be a member of team is fundamentally mm-hmm. flawed. You're totally right. Being a member of a team is actually feeling like I have your back and you have mine, mm-hmm. and we actually would do something better together than if we, you know, were working by ourselves and playing yeah. to each other's strengths in that regard as well. Yeah. Do you find that? Um... Because I think probably a lot of people feel that with the four day week, it's kind of it's employee driven. Um, It's not management driven. It's kind of, you know, it's perhaps a demand that they might feel that they're being pushed into. And perhaps, uh, you know, and yet at the same time, actually, management are employees, too. They actually often, you know, the further up the hierarchy you go, often the more pressure you have, the more you need to be looking after your well-being. Um, But do you find that there are do you find that the some people in in the companies do you find that some perhaps even managers end up working quietly on on the the fifth day of work or that they end up kind of like speaking to each other kind of quietly offhand kind of you know in the background kind of thing do some people find it much harder and resist that switching to four day week and in that in which creates really a a two system hierarchy doesn't it yeah totally i mean like you look at any change intervention in an organization, there's always going to be people, the early adopters, the people who were then brought on, the, the detractors as such. Yeah. Um, and some of those people will be very overt detractors and some, as you say, will be more covert, you know, responding to emails on Friday when everyone else is not supposed to be working on yeah. Friday or whatever yeah. it is. I think what's important for leadership is leadership enables this intervention, uh, but ultimately bottom up design is what's critical to actually making it work. So you going to the team level and saying, what type of four-day week is going to work to help actually maintain service provision for you and for you and for you? Um, we're trying to create a psychological contract here between the worker uh, and the employer in a way that's mutually beneficial to both. So actually, you can improve your well-being and we can maintain profit or productivity or whatever it is. That's that's the ultimate aim here. And organizations have been trying to do this for a long time with Lean Six Sigma, with agile ways of working. We're always looking for ways to improve efficiencies, but we haven't actually looked at the fundamental fuel that drives people's desire to be more efficient, which is motivation to do so. And nothing will drive motivation more so than knowing you can clock off uh, once your work is done. So that's what I think, you know, is, is what's critical is, is seeing us as not us versus them, but actually we all benefit in this sort of way. And in doing so, those detractors who are responding, you know, out of hours and stuff like that, they gradually um, 
are, are not shunned, but they're, they're discouraged from engaging in that sort of behavior. And ultimately, they're the only ones that are actually losing out in the intervention because they're choosing to work longer hours and they're not getting anything in return for that. They're not being rewarded for that. Um, and they're not, you know, engaging, I suppose, in the philosophy of what this intervention is trying to do, which is create a growth mindset and a different way of working for people. So we wouldn't go as overt with people like that, but actually try and understand why people feel this need to be constantly connected to work, you know, perfectionism within the workplace. Um, you know, we have a, an addiction to work. Mental mm. So we do need to start addressing some of those issues in trials as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, because um, sometimes home is where the hurt is. Home is where the isolation and loneliness is. And also sometimes for a lot of people, um, you know, whereas work, uh, people struggle, I think, sometimes with w- w- with actually finding the finding balance because work gives us immediate perhaps immediate feedback you know well done you did that project well there's a sense of growth there's a sense of achievement there's a sense of mastery there's an, a start and an end time uh, to projects so it gives that kind of much more instant or near instant gratification kind of thing that real life doesn't nobody thanks you for being a parent or cleaning your house tidying up and all the usual chores of, of ordinary life uh, so I think sometimes people are addicted to that because it, it it feels good and, and actually you kind of need to learn to live ordinary life. Yeah. And I mean, you know, with those dopamine circuits firing just because you're getting a reward for achievement, we know that that's just addiction, you know, at play as such. So um, what I suppose you challenge people is to say, like, take up a new hobby, you know, find mastery in something outside of work. And that's what people are doing. They're learning how to cook. They're volunteering with, you know, a local charity. They're doing stuff like that. So we're not saying that. And other people are simply just getting life admin done uh, on that day off as well. So um, we actually find that some people are fulfilling their needs if they had more time in the first place. And others are finally getting the breathing space to actually get on top of some of the things like, you know, feeling like they're a good parent or feeling like they're a good daughter or son or whatever it is, uh, because they now have a full day to be able to, you know, take on those responsibilities instead of cramming it all into 48 hours of the weekend. Yeah. Do, uh, is there any risk of people disengaging a little bit more from the company um, that actually, you know, that the more perhaps if people are working on a new side hustle or something like that, because, I can see that where this might, it could certainly, you know, increase productivity, and we want to get to that in just a moment. It Does it necessarily increase engagement? Because the motivations behind the two are, are, are different. It might be, yeah, I'll get more efficient in my four-day week, but because I really value this kind of, th- this extra time off, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're back engaging with the brand, does it? They're two different things. Well, totally. <laughs> totally. I mean, organizations are trying their very best to get people to buy into social missions of an organization and values and all of those sort of things. The main reason why people don't is when they see a mismatch between what's on the wall versus what's lived practice. So, mm-hmm. you know, that is being wound up into conversations around a four day week because you can you can you can rephrase a four day week in many ways because it provides so many benefits. We've seen all the data, you know, within the global trials to date. It's good for building equality within workplaces, particularly women in workplaces. It's good for a reduction in stress, improvement in physical activity, sleep levels, all those health, well-being aspects. Um, and we know that it's good for the environment as well when people are working less. So we have seen consistently people reducing their commuting time, engaging in more sustainable forms of public transport, etc. So I think actually what a four day week is trying to do is, is bring pe- bring organizations to the next phase of actually saying what they want to be and actually, you know, having the behaviors to back up that sort of thing. Four day week is not what you think of um, when trying to, you know, um, you know, improve the sustainability of your business, but actually it forces you into this you know, more crammed space to actually think, well, what is inefficient in our ways of working at the moment and how can we reduce against some of those? So I agree with you. Productivity is but one outcome that seems to come at this, but it's actually being driven by the fact that performance of people is improving as well because their stress is being reduced. Whereas I suppose productivity in the ba- in the past under principles of management was being a, a micromanagement form of uh, leadership, which looked at 
the individual as a unit, as a cog within the machine mm. and sought to exhaust them to the point of where you didn't get the return of investment, you know, of the of the cog in the machine. This is a very different uh, approach looking and informed by, you know, the science of human performance. Mm. And it also feels like a great way to, uh, you know, to um, respect the individual and the contribution of the individual, because from some of the studies that I was reading, this that increased productivity, it, it demands that each person in their role, because they're expert in their particular role, and they're the only people that see it from their perspective, as it were, the company, the, the big organization Every person has, a, you know, see has a different vision, as it were, or a different view from within that organization. So actually, it feels like a really nice way of making people feel seen. That because each person is an expert of on where the productivity, the flow, the workflow, etc., can be made more efficient. You know, isn't it in, in the setup? Because you go through a whole setup process with people. You don't just say, "Let's start a four-day week in your organization." No, it's not that simple. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we do. We bring them through a, a kind of pre kind of trial uh, onboarding kind of process of workshops and stuff. And I think you've you've hit the nail on the head. Um, what we are trying to do is actually get all levels of staff involved in identifying the the problems within an organization and all of them coming up with solutions, not just management. Mm. You always use the analogy, you know. Um, we're always downstream picking the bodies out of the water and wondering, you know, why the bodies are, are floating by us all the time. Mm. What a 40 week is doing is forcing us to spend some time upstream to see why the bodies are jumping in in the first place um, and trying to prevent it. So that is a collective endeavor of people. And I think in doing so you do, which I know you've been interested in, it helps develop meaning within work because mm. you realize I'm not just you know, this cog in the machine, I am of more value than that. Um, and especially as we see more and more of the workforce with masters and doctorates entering in in order to, you know, get into, you know, basic grade uh, roles, we need to stop infantilizing that workforce um, who are highly educated and have so much potential to tap into. Let's start empowering them very early on to take control over their work and innovate. That's what we're looking for in the world of work looking for innovation if we don't provide space for innovation in the first place how can we ever expect it to happen yeah and i was reading one of the case studies um welcome to the jungle a a company called welcome to the jungle and um there were some interesting findings in it but it and it was a really honest report because it did look at there's definitely a learning curve isn't there and at the beginning they were talking about in the sales team um they'd less time to identify prospects um, but they ended up with better focus on the high value prospects. Uh, so their sales remained the same in, in, in the end. Uh, and then they ended up again, like you were talking about this kind of creativity and innovation, they ended up kind of saying, okay, well, we actually need to divide our sales team. And one group will actually look at the approaching new clients, identifying potential prospects, and the other will focus on the sales and the actual follow through of the funnel. So there, there is adaptation needed and clearly there is a kind of a learning curve because they also kind of say at the beginning people found it a bit pressurized to get the same work done uh, but in the end they made it there yeah and i've never said doing a four-day week is easy um mm. in fact it it's probably one of the hardest things your organization will do but it is worth the investment it is worth the time and effort put in if you set this up the right way, if you go in with the right philosophy, the right type of leadership, you will be creating something better than where you started. And whether even by the end of the process, if you decide you haven't, you know, a four day week is not for you guys, um, you will have had conversations in your organization that you had you would never have had if you hadn't done something like a pilot in the first place. So you're you're totally right. Organizations become much uh they, they begin to see potential interventions that they never would have seen because they never had to, because they never had to look at getting their work done in a defined period of time before. And um, mm-hmm. I think that's quite fascinating. And it's that idea of quality over quantity. More is not always better. Um, yeah. In fact, more and more in the world at the moment seems to be creating a lot of the problems that we have in our you know, sustainability crisis. Mm. 
And I mentioned in the introduction about presenteeism, because, uh, you know, a lot of people will go to absenteeism and the cost of absenteeism. But actually, uh, 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 a uh, survey by uh, Deloitte back in post-COVID, I think it was 2023, um, estimated the cost of presenteeism to be around 3.75 to four times the cost of absenteeism. Could you talk a little bit about presenteeism and um, how that costs a company money? Because I think it ties into what you were saying there just a moment ago. Yeah, and I mean, it marries so much of the other research that's coming out. Gallup's state of the global workforce only says that about 10 to 12% of the workforce globally is actually engaged in their work. Mm. That means that we have, you know, a, a huge percentage of the population that we can work on to actually improve some of mm. that uh, return of investment in our human resource. What I think is driving presenteeism is, by and large, in this world, is... Um, Actually, sorry, could we, maybe we just to explain what presenteeism is, and I, first of all, actually might be useful. Sorry, I should have done that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I suppose it, it's people being in work, but not necessarily putting their best foot forward in their, in mm. their work. Um, so they are present, but they're not um, actually, you know, they're doing the bare minimum, essentially, in order mm. to get by. And it's bad for the worker and it's bad for the business. Um, mm. Is obviously not getting the best out of the resource that they're investing in it's bad for the worker because they don't feel um you know the benefits that actually being engaged in work can bring for their health and well-being as well um what i think is driving it is that there is such poor structure around what a work day looks like now when does uh when are certain things due by you know what are non-negotiables what does reward for your work look like and not being very transparent within organizations, which in many instances it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and more importantly, I suppose, having organizational permission to work in a way that's conducive with your preferences for work. So we know some people are morning people. We know some people are evening uh, people. And I've worked in organizations where flexibility has been encouraged, but in practice is not, you know, done. Mm -hmm. that is, it's things mm -hmm. like that that creates presenteeism within the world of work because you know, I feel this need to be online in the in the evening, even though I have all my tasks done. Um, mm. And so, again, it is some of those cultural issues that I think are driving much of the presenteeism uh, in work today. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes, you know, see in some of the you know bigger companies and they bring in food or they bring in pizzas or whatever else in the evening. And it's a very strong message of we don't expect you to go home. We'll feed you here, so you stay here. You know, <laughs> um, so I mean, a lot of the time, I think people are uh, the culture itself is is building this inefficiency because people there's only a certain amount that people can focus for in a in, in a you know in a particular day or do their best work in, in a particular day, um, and therefore they perhaps save it for those later hours, perhaps, and that doesn't even recognize people's biology in terms of when they're they're most focused and they're most at the most efficient but you know I, I you know you do see it in people they're kind of um wandering through the day because they know that just the culture is to stay there all day you yeah know, for hours and and i always you know we have this constant narrative now i don't have enough time that is mm. like we just say that all the time in life now mm. but actually it's not that we don't have enough time it's just that we're not using our time very wisely and you know, like you said, there is there might be two hours worth of work to actually be done in the day, but you're spending eight hours there trying to fill mm -hmm. the void to be seen by management to be doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do need to be looking at, you know, redesigning work in a way that actually gets the most out of people, but also allows them time to rest and recover. Rest and recovery is critical in order to actually get the best out of people in the first place. So if mm -hmm. you have a worker who's commuting an hour and a half in, spending eight hours in the office then commuting an hour and a half home where is their time to rest mm -hmm. where's time to come back and be a better version of themselves uh, the day after so you know you can see how a cycle of disengagement begins to occur when you see cumulative levels of fatigue begin to happen within people across a work week yeah is there a, a habituation factor um is there the risk some companies might kind of think well are we going to end up you know, as opposed to, to exaggerate it, ending up eventually looking for a three-day week. Or is there a habituation factor? D does that productivity and that either equal or increased productivity, does it slack over time? So we just published uh, 
well, last October, we published our first 12 month findings. So those organizations that actually had gone through the first six months and, and we mm. followed them through at the 12 month mark. What we found was that everyone at the six month mark continued on at the 12 month mark. So hundred percent, you know, um, continuance mm. of a four day week trial. Uh, everything else continued to improve with regards to reduction of stress, improvement of physical activity, improvement in performance. Interestingly, one thing slightly rose throughout um, the the six to twelve month mark was still lower than the baseline, which was burnout. So we know that burnout is a much more complex phenomenon than reduction in working hours alone. We know that it involves multiple leadership and organizational workload uh, management issues. So it's it's not surprising that we might see fluctuations in levels of burnout. Um, we know that a four day week obviously makes a positive impact on uh, issues of burnout, but we need to be looking at a more holistic intervention to try and tackle, you know, that occupational malady as a whole. Um, I would say as well that from the habituation point of view, um, I don't know what the end point is. Who knows? Maybe we'll only be working two days a week with AI. Um, we ultimately get to determine that as people, as whether, you know, AI is going to take all our jobs away or whether we're going to create new jobs because of AI, you know. Yeah. The same we made the same decision with technology when it came to the 2000s as well um the fundamental thing i think of what we're doing now is tipping the balance back to marrying the working hours with the types of work with the, with the parts of ourselves that we're currently using in our in our work so the five day eight, you know nine to five formed from a very physically laborious work uh, in the industrial revolution mm. we are now a highly cognitive and emotional workforce and the fundamental physiology is that our brains haven't got the same resilience um, as our bodies do when it comes to mm. muscle power and energy. So all we're doing is putting things back in balance, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there's a discussion to be had uh, 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 around fair workload, though, isn't there? I mean, that is something that needs to be discussed a bit more because, you know, I, I always say if people like me are brought in to talk about, you know, to talk about stress management, it can often be just another thing the employee is expected to do, uh, you know, heal thyself, fix thyself, as it were, but we're still going to put you back in the same system that's actually broken. Um, you know, that can happen as well. So there is a conversation, I think, to be had around the what is fair workload. Totally. Uh, absolutely agree. I think, you know, we saw this exponential rise in productivity when technology came in and, mm. you know, AI is going to you know, create a similar level of conversation for us as well. Um, mm -hmm. I used to be very frustrated when doing my, my PhD, when talking about issues of fatigue and burnout and all of the literature would say, you know, better, better resilience training for our healthcare workers. And I was like, the system is on it. You know? Exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. So like, I think it's, it's for too long become a scapegoat for, you know, organizations. Yeah. Um, recently Oxford published this huge study which shows that organizational level intervention is the only thing that's going to move the dial on organizational well-being um, and I think organizations haven't woken up to it yet but they are going to begin to work up wake up to it when they realize they're investing huge amounts of money in mental health interventions that are simply not returning you know the investment for them yeah because they're really the band-aids over the the actual it's the the system is the problem, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I, I know the study you're talking about. Um, do you think that there will come a day when companies are going to be expected to contribute to the medical bills, to the state medical bills for the stress, the stress that they cause? Because at the end of the day, generally speaking, the studies would say that most people would will, will say that their greatest source of stress is their workplace. Um, so they're suffering for the benefit of companies to some extent, and yet at the same time, it's the state that foots the bill. Do you think that's a, it's a, it's a, certainly a, it's a, it's a, it's a good discussion to have, I think, isn't it? I love that, Susanna. What a great way to get companies on board. <laughs> <laughs> totally right. I mean, there have been landmark cases in, you know, Canada, for example, with shift work nurses who, um we brought a case against the state because they were, they you know had a an increased risk of developing breast cancer from doing shift work so mm -hmm. we spent about a third of our adult lives if not more in work of course it's going to have a positive or negative impact on 
our health. Mm. And so I do think that, you know, it, it would be a brave intervention by um by politicians and leaders to actually hold businesses more accountable within this space. Um because I think you, we will always have the front runners, the people who have engaged engaged in our trials, want to improve the well being of their workforce, whether altruistically or because they know that it's good for business. Mm. Um, we know that there will be a groundswell of people now starting to join trials like this because you know the war for talent will compel them to do so. Um, mm. But ultimately, how do we get organisations? which are so deeply, you know, embedded in their ways, including the public sector, uh, involved in trials like this. And I think, yeah, sometimes we might need to, to crack the whip a small bit to get them to, the, to reflect inwards a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I think it's probably going to go that way because the health bill has just become so unmanageable for for. For countries, generally speaking, uh, you know, I, I do think that's going to be a, a discussion we're going to we're going to be having, and people are going to start looking at. Uh, Dale, what is in store for the organisation, the four day week global organisation for twenty twenty four and and the the near years to come? Yeah, so I mean, I think we went from being pretty much an advocacy group about a year ago to now being a social business. So, so we are funded through organizations signing up and using our services, our advisory services on how best to do a four day week. Uh, and so we have a few different uh, services that we provide. We f- provide a, a course, which people can do of their own volition. We have the actual, you know, uh, supported pilot, and then we have consulting as well um, and an accreditation program coming out as well. So. We'll be building out those offerings in order to you know, support organizations and wherever they are in the journey. More broadly, what's important to me is that we start having a conversation around what would a four day world look like. So I think that's the next research agenda for us is being able to extrapolate some of our current data to what m- might be broader implications for society uh, and for our environment. Um, and what we're trying to do is create a million new years of free time in order to be able to understand what some of that uh, mm. fun- change within society would look like um lastly then you know we have published by and large in western countries and we you know it's it's important for me that this is an equitable conversation that we continue that we as an organization have control over building um because we've been at the forefront of the conversation to date so we've been signing partnerships with leaders across the world who want to bring this and to their own countries their own businesses within their countries and trying to create that grassroots led um, approach to a four day week in Botswana to India to you mm. know Italy uh, to Brazil so that's probably our it's fulfilling I suppose the very thing that's within our name which is to be a global organization mm-hmm. it's a it's a really really uh, interesting organization and interesting movement I it, it's I'm convinced it's the future. I really am. So, um, you know, it's 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 exciting times for you all. Um, I always finish uh, chats by asking for um, your recommendation in terms of what tweak might somebody make. Now, I know this is slightly different in in, the, in this conversation, but is there anything that you'd recommend people do? Because so, a lot of people might be saying, "I'd love it," but you know, no way would my my company. Um, you know, listen to me or whatever. What? How can you help people who would love to, either from the management position or from the employee position? What might what might you recommend? Yeah, so let's take. Um, I think you need to look at who your stakeholder is that you need to convince in the first place. So, if I'm a non-management person, I want to bring this in. As management, all I care about is the numbers, really. Mm-hmm. So, I want to see that actually I can bring in something that could lead to growth within the organization. And we now have that data to show that, you know, we can reduce working time. It can help you with all your other transformation projects, which you're spending way more money on, by the way, technology and finance transformation. Mm -hmm. And we can, you know, reduce absenteeism, reduce presenteeism. You could, um, you know, create a much more highly engaged workforce and trying to create some numbers to, to marry that of what you think might be some of the cost savings then for your organization. So getting some baseline data using our statistics and then, you know, making the business case essentially for it mm-hmm. uh, and being able to manage what some of the, the change concerns that leadership might have, which might be, well, we can't do this across the whole, the whole organization. You don't have to, you could try mm-hmm. it 
can wear it. You could experiment, you know, it's a pilot. There is no right or wrong way to do this. Um, and there are resources there available on our website, paid or freemium, you know, for you to, to get kickstarted in this journey. Great. Yeah. So lots of information on your your fantastic website in terms of kind of helping people to make that pitch, I think. Uh, and as you say, and I think that's really important that it doesn't have to necessarily be the whole organization. You could just possibly pilot it in a, in a, in a one department or whatever. I think that's a really important message that people mightn't consider and mightn't have thought of before. So yeah. Dale, where should people find you and more information? Yeah, so you can check out our website, uh, well, 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 uh, dot dot uh, We're on all social media uh, platforms as well. LinkedIn and Instagram is probably our most active and Twitter uh, as well to a lesser degree now. Or X. Um, <laughs> we actually publish up-to-date research basically on, on a day-to-day -day basis and give updates as to what's happening for the week trials globally as well. So we're not mm -hmm. simply marketing you from, you know, sign up to our services. We're mm -hmm trying to build the evidence base around why working time reduction is good for businesses and trying to make that conversation as as you know widely disseminated as possible mm -hmm. okay well you know it is a conversation that is going to run and run and i think uh, very much grow legs in i think very immediate future so um i wish you all the very best of luck and every success in this for everybody's sake um, so, uh, Dr. Dale Quilahan, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, guys, I hope that was helpful to you. I hope it's really started a conversation. Start the conversation. Start talking about it in the canteen. Start talking about it in the pub or wherever you are and get this conversation flowing and going. Um, there is loads of information, as Dale mentioned, on, on their website to actually back up with, with proper uh, well-run research. So there, there's lots of a body of evidence there for you already um, to, to, to support this discussion. All right. So until we chat again uh, for next week's episode, take care of yourselves and each other. All the very best. Thanks for joining us, Dale. Thank you, Susanna.